North Shore hikers love finding themselves en route to the Lions. Lionsgate emergency room? Not so much. Hello everyone. Thank you all for joining us. I'm Scott Montague from Coquitlam Search and Rescue, and I'll be managing the risky business of Zoom and Facebook Live tonight. Your cameras and mics are off for the session, but we still wanna hear your comments and questions. If you have a question, throw it in the Q&A box so that we can keep track of them and we'll either answer live or online. If you don't want the audience to see your name, just mark your question as anonymous. I'll also be keeping an eye on the chat box and posting links there as we go. Also, feel free to use the reactions buttons throughout the webinar. For those of you who stick with us till the end, you'll have a chance to win a giveaway from our sponsor, BrightSource. And everyone will have a chance to win, well, everyone actually, not even a chance, you'll definitely have a freebie from our sponsor, FatMap. But let's start off with a quick poll for those of you who are joining us on Zoom. Whereabouts in the back country are, like, do you like to play? I don't know. Do you like to play in the Coast Mountains? Maybe Vancouver Island, Thompson, Okanagan, the Caribou Chilcotin Coast, the Kootenai Rockies. Maybe it's Northern BC. Maybe you like to play as I do outside BC occasionally. I'm down at uh, Mount Baker. I'm planning tomorrow to go uh, camping at Mount Hood and I'll be there for a week. So please go ahead and pump your answer in there right now. And while you are doing that, I'd also like to welcome the executive director of Adventure Smart in BC, our eclectic essentials educator extraordinaire, Sandra Riches. Thank you. Do you have a special dictionary that you look up all of these intros? I, I'm always impressed every single week. I just I, I look forward to this to see what uh, what conundrum rhyme you come up with. Thank you, Scott. We're, we're really quite fortunate to have such a um, an energetic tech support, also known as Scott, who belongs to Coquitlam Search and Rescue. We're quite fortunate. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Sandra, as Scott mentioned. Uh, and I've been with the Adventure Smart program since inception. So we're almost two decades old, 20 years coming up on that next year. And I've loved every minute of it. It's really a passion of mine. Uh, it's just uh, a big part of my life and uh, I love to play outside. So it's really aligned great. Ah, here we can check out where everybody is. Coast Mountains, okay, 36%. The island, good rep over from the island. That's good to see. Thompson Okanagan, welcome aboard. Uh, Caribou, nice, small percentage, but that's okay. Kootenai, 5%. Northern, good, nice. And outside BC, 14%. Beautiful. Well, we'd love to know where that outside B BC is and inside BC. Let us know the actual location. It's always fun for me to know who we're talking to. Uh, and later, I, I kind of mull it over and think about who's joined us. And, and uh, nonetheless, you're all welcome. I'm grateful to be joining you tonight from the traditional territory of Alilawat First Nation and, and uh, Squamish. Uh, I, I play a lot outside and love every minute of it. My passions are skiing in the winter and mountain biking in the summer. Just got back from a nice little ride before I have the pleasure in sitting with you. Uh, I'm going to share a few basic things with you tonight. I just wanna go over a couple points before I hand over the mic. And this just allows us to remind or introduce you to what Adventure Smart is all about and what we what we share. I'm assuming you're here, you have some idea 
you have some idea of, of the messaging. This is just a friendly reminder about the resources and the actions that we'd like you to take. Our three T's are very common, consistent, and delivered everywhere we go. Uh, the British Columbia Search and Rescue Association started Adventure Smart in 2004. Uh, based on that success, it went national in 2009. So there is representation in every single territory and province, which is quite um, rewarding for all of us. And the message is consistent, no matter where you are in Canada. If you hear it from me, Scott, our guest, uh, uh, over 500 volunteer educators in British Columbia and the rest outside of BC, this will be the consistent messaging. We want you to file a trip plan. Plan that ahead with your group and your party, your family, your friends. Take the time to really go through the paces with that and do your research. It can really make a difference and, and a better outcome and provide you success to help you reach your destination, but which we say always, your destination is always home. Training is critical. Having the right training for the activity that you choose to do is, is a key part to your, your uh, recipe, if you will. This is really the trifecta of safety and all, and that training piece is, is a big one. That can be certification-based, it can be mentorship, and it all collects together, but it's always continuous. It's ongoing, ongoing. And then taking those essentials with you. This is the foundation of your pack, and then you would add to it season and sports specific. That foundation stays steady, just like the foundation on your house. It doesn't move, hopefully. Uh, it doesn't crack, it doesn't alter. You might refresh a few things. I know I refresh the water and food. Obviously, I go through that here and there if needed. Uh, water, yes, but those, those essentials stay there. And then don't forget to add to it season and sport specific and personal. I need glasses now to read and see. Those are a big piece that have to come with me now. Maybe medication that you have that's required. Your favorite trail mix, your favorite chocolate. There's a few things that are important to us that are also essential, needed and desired. We have a trip plan app and here's a great easy way, fast way for you to have access to it. It's free of charge. It's available to anyone in Canada. The Adventure Smart Trip Plan app allows you to go through the paces as you plan your adventure, no matter the season or the sport. And you can check, check off the boxes with the gear you're taking. Uh, you can pick and describe the route that you're going on, the transportation you're taking to and from. If you're not really sure what a trip plan consists of, this will allow you to fill in the fields and then expand on it, and then send it to an emergency contact, which is key, that's key. You've had a chat with this person, you've picked them wisely, and they know what to do with you um, with this information in case there is an emergency. Uh, and they know that that number is 911 to share this information, and then it will get to search and rescue through police. In case of emergency, and I'm almost wrapped up here and I'll introduce my guest, uh, in an emergency, in British Columbia, we're really encouraging everyone to apply the stop analogy. Uh, in BC, based on data-driven insights, there's 1,500 search and rescue calls in the province currently, 78 search and rescue groups, and 3,400 volunteers. We all want you to, me included, Scott and our guest. If you're in trouble, we want you to stop. Please don't go down a ravine, a gully, a draw, a creek, a river. Stopping will help you every time. Then you need to think about your situation, observe that it's a safe space to be in, check those observations around you, and then plan with the essentials you have with you, your communication devices that you're carrying. But this stop analogy, this action, call to action for you in an emergency, will help reduce the severity of a call. Because if you keep moving, more than not, you get injured. Uh, and it will be easier for search and rescue volunteers to find you if you're not moving. So the stop analogy is a great one. As I introduce our guest, uh, Dr. Alec Ritchie, we're so fortunate and honored. Um, do you have any plans to go to the Lionsgate Hospital anytime soon or needing search and rescue services on the North Shore? Uh, we hope not. I really hope not. But if you do, you might just run into our guest here tonight. Dr. Alec Ritchie is a highly acclaimed emergency physician at the Lionsgate Hospital in North Vancouver, which is also one of the busiest regions in Canada for search and rescue. He's a medical consultant for BC Emergency Health Services and a volunteer member, North Shore Rescue, and a clinical professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at UBC. We're very honored to welcome Alec and I look forward to his presentation as well. I'm gonna get comfortable, hope you do too. And uh, we'll pass the mic and stage over to our very special guest. Welcome, Alec. Thank you, Sandra. and Thank you for your kind words. I'm just gonna share my screen here.
and I'm hoping everybody uh, sees my uh, uh, screen. How about that, Scott? Are we there? Perfect. Good to All go. Right. We'll move ahead. So uh, thank you uh, again, Sandra. Thank you, Adventure Smart, for inviting me. And uh, thank you to all the viewers that came in. Uh, I hope uh, that you'll be interested in my talk, which is risk mitigation for outdoor adventure. And I realize that the, the term risk mitigation sounds pretty, uh, uh, almost like a lawyer. And uh, I, I don't mean it like that. Uh, perhaps I can do it uh, pictorially like this. And basically, we just want to we want to enjoy the outdoors, but we want to reduce the risk when we go out, out there. So that's the concept here. Uh, what I'd like to present tonight, uh, I'd like to go through some uh, philosophical musings. I hope you'll uh, humor me while I do that. I'd like to tell you a bit, a bit uh, about North Shore Rescue and, and some of the statistics of what we do. Uh, uh, we're Canada's busiest search and rescue team. And then I'd like to go through a real rescue that I attended that um, uh, there was a news, uh, some news footage on, and we'll dissect it and we'll find out what went wrong, what actually caused this rescue to happen. And then we'll go through the risk mitigation part. Um, Sandra, Sandra has already, already told you about the three T's. I'm going to add a fourth to make it four T's. And rather than stealing my thunder, I think it's, it's really important to follow Sandra's presentation there. And here's the hint to the viewers. If you hear it twice, if you hear it from both Sandra and I, it's probably important. Uh, we'll go through the essentials, what I'll call the 10 essentials. We'll, we'll talk about that. And then we'll review, hopefully have some time for questions after that. So moving ahead, please uh, humor me and allow me to share you some of my philosophies on outdoor adventure. The first premise is that outdoor adventure is good. I, I think it's good for all of us. I know it's good for me. I know what it does for me. And I'm sure it does the same for you and for virtually everybody that enjoys it. It makes us better people. It makes us better people for ourselves, for our significant other. Perhaps it makes us a, a better father or brother or sister. Uh, it probably makes us a better co-worker. It, uh, it, it feeds our, our body, our, our mind and our soul. Um, it can be for some people their, their mental health therapy. It can, for some people it can be their religion. So outdoor adventure, I believe is good. Second definition, it, it includes some risk or some hazard, and that's what makes adventure what it is. Um, and I think we should recognize that and embrace it, uh, uh, but be wary of it. Know that outdoor adventure has risk. Now, adventure without risk is Disneyland. Who wants that? The first half of this was uh, uh, said uh, by a, a very famous person that was Copeland, and I just added the, the last part. But we don't want fake adventure. We want the, the real thing. We don't want to go to an amusement park. We don't want to be coddled and, and necessarily protected all the time. We don't want to be wrapped in bubble wrap. But we have to, again, recognize that adventure is not without this. And the final premise then is that if we recognize and appreciate and accept that adventure has risk, we should also know that it can and should be mitigated, and we should take steps towards that to make sure we're doing the right thing. So thank you for humoring me. That's my philosophy. Let's go on to North Shore Rescue, uh, what it is and some statistics. I hope to not bore you with these. I, I don't think I will. I, I think it's, you'll find it quite interesting. So how does search and rescue work in British Columbia? As Sandra mentioned, there are 78 volunteer search and rescue teams, all facilitated by what used to be Emergency Management of British Columbia. It's now called Emergency Management and Climate Readiness, and also the BC Search and Rescue Association. Uh, all team members have to do a formal course called Ground Search and Rescue, and that's through the Justice Institute, which is the, sort of the university for police, firefighters, paramedics, and, and GSAR members. Um, a person that's in trouble calls 911. You don't call the rescue teams directly. And search and rescue teams can't just decide, hey, let's go on a call. We have to be formally tasked by a government agency to go on calls. And those government agencies are people like police, ambulance, fire, parks, sometimes the coroner. And um, that's, that's how we go out uh, and go on our calls. And I think I talked uh, what the whole uh, talk was on the fact that there's no charge 
for search and rescue services. It's free for everybody at all times. So the North Shore Rescue Team has been around for a long time, since 1965. We're the busiest search and rescue team in, in BC and in Canada. We have about 40 active members and 30 resource members. And our active members are on stuff uh, or, or, or uh, butts on the, on the helicopter, as it were. Um, and we have about 30 resource members and they're people that you know, are behind the scenes or don't go on all calls, but maybe take care of our IT equipment or our motorized equipment or uh, uh, do uh, uh, some clerical work for us in that. And we're called resource members because it's a pretty big organization and it's pretty busy as you'll see. Uh, I realized, or Sandra told me that a lot of people viewing this won't be local. And so I thought I'd spend just a minute uh, sharing the topography and geography of, of Vancouver's North Shore. So you can see it's a large area, it's rugged, it's steep, it's very f densely forested. And there's three commercial ski hills, and they're associated to the back country or side country. There's Mount Seymour, Grouse Mountain, and Cypress. And in the winter, they're all busy with skiers, and, and uh, in the summer, a lot of hiking around there. And it's very close proximity to, Van to downtown Vancouver. And I like to tell people that you know, you're only a 20 minute city bus ride away from a significant consequence in the back country. That's the beauty and the curse of the North Shore Mountains. And there are a lot of summits there, as you can see, uh, uh, ranging between uh, uh, about 700 and, and 1800 meters above sea level. Lots of mountains to climb. And uh, that's what they look like. There's distinct seasons. We have a distinct winter and a distinct summer. Although some people say Vancouver only has two seasons, more wet and less wet. Um, there are distinct uh, seasonal differences, and you can see the, the uh, topography there. These are real mountains. And the North Shore Rescue Team does a lot of rescues. We're very busy. We do a lot of helicopter-based stuff. It's not because we're lazy. It's because it's the fastest and sometimes safest way to get in and get out with some of our subjects. So you, look, you can look at the rescue statistics there. Um, we are very busy. In 2021, it was our record-breaking year, we went on 226 calls. Last year was a bit more sane at 142, but our five-year average is over 150 calls per year. Do the math, and remember, we're all volunteer rescuers with day jobs. We're busy every month of the year. Of course, July, August are our busiest, and we're busy every day of the week, although, of course, Saturday and Sunday are our busiest. Uh, Cypress, Grouse, and Seymour, as I said, the three local mountains are where we do most of our calls. Mutual aid is when we help other um, search and rescue teams around the vicinity and actually around the province. Occasionally we'll do urban searches for things like uh, demented walkaway uh, uh, subjects, that sort of thing. And uh, we'll do other things, other tasks, depending on, on what uh, is asked of us. And this is the sort of thing people are doing when we need to go rescue them. You can see most of the time it's hiking, but all sorts of other things, you know, snow sports, climbing, biking, fishing, uh, uh, down climbing, that sort of thing. And uh, we, we published some research uh, this year. Uh, we looked at 25 years uh, of our calls. We couldn't go back to 1965 because there weren't a lot of good records, but we went back 25 years and published what went on during those medical calls. Uh, our results, uh, I went to uh, uh, the International Commission on Alpine Rescue in Montreux, Switzerland, back in October, and presented this uh, uh, there. And it was published uh, earlier this year in Wilderness and Environmental Medicine, a very significant uh, wilderness medicine journal. And basically, we, we reviewed, as I said, 25 years of calls. and. Anybody that you know, was handed over to ambulance, that went to hospital, or that unfortunately died, these were considered medical calls, and we looked at every one of those calls. So we looked at almost 2,100 calls in general, and 41% of, of all our calls were classified as medical, and as you can see, there were 906 medical subjects for calls. The average age, 35 years, and 65% were male. 
Mostly it was trauma at 54%, but we actually thought that would have been higher, but it wasn't. And 41% are non-trauma. That is, it wasn't an injury. It was more of an illness. Um, top three activities causing medical rescue, hiking, biking, and snow sports, as you see. Predominantly, you know, we, we did mountain rescue, but there is also some urban involved in some shoreline. And as you can see by the map, uh, most of it was heavily on the North Shore. Uh, with some uh, uh, um, urban searches and some mutual aid searches outside of the lower mainland. For traumatic injuries, the top three body regions uh, that were injured were lower limb, as you might imagine, twisted knees, twisted ankles, that sort of thing. Unfortunately, head injuries were, were also common, and then torso injuries. For non-traumatic medical incidents, and this surprised us, 25% each for exposure, sort of hypothermia or, or even heat illness, but also mental health issues. One quarter of all non-traumatic medical calls were for mental health issues, and, and this, this surprised us. And then 11% were, were cardiovascular, things like uh, chest pain, heart attack, that sort of thing. We scored this with a National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics score on acuity, that is how sick, how injured, how severe uh, off is, is the, the person. And that's a scale from one to seven. One, basically no injury or disease, and seven meaning lethal. Um, you can see that, that most of the subjects were two on that scale, so quite low, but 49% were classified as three or greater. And at three or greater, they need to visit a hospital, and as they go up from three, they need to be uh, uh, admitted to hospital, and they need surgery and that sort of thing. So it was not insignificant, a lot of our calls. And unfortunately, as I said, uh, uh, some of them do result in death. All right, enough of that stuff. Let's go on and look at a real rescue that was done. And what I have to do that with, to start, is, a, is some news footage. And we're going to change over now. It was hard to embed this and get you to see it properly. So uh, Scott's going to do that behind the scenes. We're going to let him get ready. And we'll look at a real rescue. Please listen carefully. The ride down the Grouse Mountain gondola was reassuring to two hikers who got lost in frigid temperatures Tuesday night. They were carrying little that would keep them alive. And we just get lost and we get, we get wet. So we get cold very fast and yeah, we just can't generate any heat. The pair started late morning took a wrong turn and by sunset they were in snow and lost. They are not very well prepared. They North Shore Search and Rescue say the pair was lucky to be in cell range. Rescuers loaned the hikers proper jackets until they warmed up. They did not have flashlights, they did not have maps, had a little bit of extra clothing but not much. They were very, very cold when we got to them. Perhaps because of this incident, Metro Vancouver has just closed backcountry trails in Lynn Headwaters, so it may be time to take heed of what you might need in the face of a fast approaching winter. Peter Granger, CTV News, North Vancouver. All right, so that looks like we're back at our beginning here. I'm going to move ahead quickly, resume slideshow, there we are, perfect, all right, so what happened there, so there were two newcomers to Vancouver, she was from Toronto, he was from Taiwan, they're in their 20s, and they decided to go on a hike in, on the North Shore Mountains, they're inexperienced, and they just went to Google, they didn't really know the area, but they saw this great hike called, uh, uh, called uh, the the hike that they went on was very difficult, and they had no idea that that was going to be difficult. They had no idea that there was fresh snow up high. They didn't tell anybody about their plans. They were green. They were they were environmental. That's good. They went by transit, but they got a late morning start, and they packed relatively light. They had no extra clothing, really, poor footwear, and they didn't realize how long or, or strenuous this, this hike would be. It's the Haynes Valley hike. 
And as they were send, uh, ascending towards Crown, the Crown Pass, uh, uh, which is the high point almost, it began getting dark. They were moving slowly because it, it was unexpected to them that there was snow on the ground. They had no lights, small amount of food, and despite all this, they carried on until it was too dark to carry on any further. And then finally, they called 911. Luckily for them, they had a cell signal. So this all happened on November 2nd. Now, on November 1st, that is the day before, North Shore Rescue posted, winter's here, prepare accordingly. And we sent out a, a photo of the first snowfall on the local mountains. So all this information was easy to be had if you had done your homework. So November 2nd, we send that out, North Shore Rescue you know, alerts the public, and uh, pardon me, on, on November 1st, and then on November 2nd, this couple goes hiking and gets caught. So there's the Haynes Valley route. We start over here. I don't know if you can see my cursor at Lynn Headwater. It's relatively flat until you get to this point, but then it's quite steep uphill. And the subjects were right there just after they come up this steep hill. And this shows the elevation, how it's, it's gradual until it gets very, very steep at the end. That's where they stop. And this is an actual photograph of that night. This is actually me over here in the orange. This is a teammate of mine. Uh, the gentleman on the left uh, is wearing the red puffy of my teammate. The woman on the right is wearing the orange puffy that I gave her. And uh, remember those colors, orange and red. It's no mistake, those are the, the puffies that we carried. And we've got a, a blanket we're putting over them. We're warming them up right now because this is just after we arrived. So we had to hike in from Grouse Mountain. We got a, a tram up to Grouse Mountain, hiked down to get them. But the, the wet snow was challenging for us as well. And we finally got there about 11 o'clock at night. They were cold, they were wet, but luckily they were uninjured and they were fairly good condition. Um, we warmed them up, uh, we gave them heat vests, we gave the, uh, put in a, that emergency blanket over them, we gave them some, flu, some food, some warm fluids and some dry clothing. We put a, a cramp on. We gave them headlamps, ours, uh, because we carry extra, and then we led them out. So let's consider now what went wrong. What, what caused uh, this couple to get in distress and what caused them to have to be rescued? When I give this talk in high schools, this is where I pause and then we, we form groups and I, I have the high school students write down what they think went wrong. It's not really difficult to find because it's all there. Uh, I've already shared with you went wrong. We know that they were inexperienced and that they chose this Haynes Valley route from Google, not really knowing the area of the terrain. They didn't know that there had been fresh snow up high, and I showed how the day before it was made apparent that they had just done their homework. They didn't tell anybody about their plans. They got a late morning start. They didn't pack enough things in the way of food and light and clothing. And they kept going when, when they knew that they were going to be in trouble. It's pretty simple to see what, what, what went wrong. So what can we do to mitigate these things? Well, uh, Sandra's already shared with you the, the three T's, and I'm going to add a fourth to make four T's, and we're going to discuss those. So Adventure Smart has been very good at getting this message apart, uh, across, that is, and I'm just uh, piggybacking on them. So the first T is trip planning. And I like to break it down into 1A and 1B. 1A being plan your trip. So plan your travel route, learn about it, know the terrain, know the conditions, like if there's going to be. Now, locally, where we are, it's been very, very warm, almost 30 degrees last week, but there's still over a meter of snow up high. You should check the weather conditions, the forecast, know what time sunsets, all that sort of thing. And these are easy to do ahead of time. You just have to put them in the record. Secondly, you should leave a trip plan. And uh, uh, Adventure Smart has that great app. Something like that is just perfect. Fill it out in detail and then send it or leave it if it's printed with the responsible person. And that is a person that cares about you and wants you to pack in one piece and will do the right thing in alerting authorities if you're not back by the prescribed time. Um, and again, no one will know you're missing 
and I ser initiate a search with you if you don't leave a trip plan. So the first T, trip planning, uh, uh, is 1A and 1B. Plan your trip and leave a trip plan. Second is training. And, and training is, is, sometimes it seems obvious, but it should be sort of specific. Training can be broken down in, in both knowledge and skill and then general fitness. So the, the knowledge is knowing how to do things, knowing how to perhaps tie knots or, or make a fire, uh, um, uh, know, knowledge of first aid, that sort of thing. And the skills, you know, you have to, skills are things you have to practice and it's good to practice them at home when maybe the pressure is not on rather than attract, you know, do them for the first time in the back when you need to. Um, general fitness, of course, is important and training for that is, is uh, pretty common and I, I won't go into what you need to do, but it should be sport specific. Uh, one example of this is uh, my, my cousin is one of my best friends. He's, he's my blood relative, my uh, mother's sister's son, but he and I do a, an adventure every year. And uh, one year we, uh, we hiked the Grand Canyon rim to rim in a day. And we did it in the month of May, but it's already very, very hot there. And you know, being, being both of us were from Vancouver, I wanted to do some heat training. So I actually did some training in a sauna because you can actually acclimatize yourself ahead of time. So for two weeks, I trained in the sauna before I left uh, uh, for, for the Grand Canyon. And I was already heat acclimatized by the time I was there. So uh, uh, it can be uh, uh, condition specific and again, sport specific. If you're gonna go on a long bike ride, train by riding a bike. If you're gonna go on a long climb, train by climbing. Um, that's the sport specificity and the location specificity. Uh, specific training for wilderness survival and there are courses on this, navigation. I'd already mentioned first aid. Consider joining a group or an organization. And, and that's a really good way where more experienced people can sort of mentor and, and, and share things with less experienced people. It's a nice way to meet people as well. And training means practicing what you're doing. And I assume you enjoy this stuff, and that means getting out more and then having more fun. So it should all go hand in hand. The training shouldn't be onerous. It should be pleasant and a pleasure to do. And finally, it's sort of uh, stolen from the, the lottery corporation, the gambling people is know your limit and stay within it. So that's that's the training uh, 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 aspect, and that's the second of the three T's that Adventure Smart talks about. The third is is uh, take the essentials. Uh, I put down take the ten essentials because they used to be called the ten essentials. Now maybe more than ten, depending. Uh, you'll see none of these include a, a beacon, a probe, or a shuttle, which of course are absolute uh, essentials if you're going to be riding in the backcountry in snow conditions. Uh, or avalanche risk mitigation, so, but I've still kept the term here, take the 10 essentials. And if you Google hiking 10 essentials, you'll get a whole bunch of lists. Some of, some of them won't be exactly the same 10 things. They'll be pretty close. What I'm presenting are the 10 things that North Shore Rescue thinks are, are the top 10. And I thought I'd take the time to, to uh, uh, cover each one. On that source, it should be obvious uh, uh, is an important thing because sometimes you're you're cut out at night uh, or sometimes we call it benighted, um, uh, and it can be an unpleasant thing if you don't have a light source. Of course, a, a hand, a flashlight, or hand torch, as they're sometimes called, is one thing you could get. But a, way more practical, I think, is a headlamp because it leaves both your hands free and uh, you can do a lot of things with your headlamp on your head. So most people will do that. There's, there's different types you can get with different features. I prefer simpler ones, uh, less uh, things to remember how to work and, and less things to go wrong. Um, uh, you should consider all the things that can be better from small and lightweight. Uh, remember extra batteries. A signaling device is very, very important. You want to be able to be heard and or seen uh, from a distance. And maybe it's going to be in the air because uh, you know we do a lot of helicopter search and rescue and uh, also at night so you want to be bright in the top left there you'll see something called a signal mirror and it's got a little hole in it and you can um, you can flash you can use the reflection of the sun to flash in the mirror and send a flash of light a long distance and the hole in the middle is to look into the distance and see where you're flashing the light so you can aim it and flash it at rescuers or even flash it up at a helicopter. 
uh, to its right, or, and you see a whistle attached to that. Um, I remember a case where uh, we were chasing a snowboarder all over Mount Seymour one night at about three in the morning because he kept moving and he was way out of bounds. And a couple times we got close enough that I guess he heard our yelling and he told us that he yelled back, but we couldn't hear him. When we finally caught up, he was hoarse, he could barely speak for yelling, and he was upset that we couldn't hear him. And then I pointed at the little chest buckle on his backpack. And I says, too bad you didn't have a whistle, because of course there was an integral whistle in that, and he didn't know it. A lot of backpacks are made now, the little plastic piece is also a whistle. And if he had only known to use that and, and uh, sound his whistle, we probably would have rescued him several hours earlier. Uh, the woman at the bottom is holding a flare, and up above her there you can see flares, uh, and uh, there's actually some bear bangers there too to make sound. Just be careful, in the summer when it's dry, flares uh, uh, or even bear bangers can start fires, so you want to be very careful with that. Anything that's bright, bright colored clothing is a good idea. You can wave it at, at, a, at a helicopter or to someone in the distance, or if you're tromping through the woods, uh, we can see you. There's nothing worse than when I'm in the helicopter looking down and we radio back to our, our command and say, what was the subject wearing? And they say, you know, black pants and a dark green jacket. You know, us trying to find them through a forest canopy is going to be very, very difficult if that's what they're wearing. Fire. I, I don't burn down a forest, but being able to start a fire can do very many important things if, if you're going to be spending a night or some time in the backcountry. It, um, it makes you feel safer. It gives light. It warms you up. It can warm your food. It just uh, um, can make things seem a lot better. And it's something you might think is easy, but you, know, you should learn how to start a small fire. And what can you take that's, that's burnable? Well, you know, there are the IKEA candles and that, but some people don't know that uh, like even bike inner tubes if they're cut up in smaller pieces, they burn quite well, and they burn even when they're a bit wet. Sometimes it's a black, acrid, sort of smoky flame, but they burn quite well. Um, Vaseline is also known as petroleum jelly. Think of that, petroleum. If you take some cotton balls and soak them in Vaseline, you can put them in a plastic bag, and even if they get a bit damp, they'll still burn quite well and quite long. There are store-bought fire uh, uh, starting kits you can buy, but there's a lot of other things you can use to sort of make tinder or, or make things that will burn for a while. And again, you want to practice this at home first. Don't burn down the forest. So important, and most people seem to know the, the layering system uh, well now, uh, so uh, forgive me for, for reviewing it, but you want to dress in layers. Basically, your, your, your base layer should fit fairly snug to the skin, and its job is to transport moisture, because we all perspire a bit and create moisture, and you want to get it away from your body. You want to keep your body dry, because with, with dryness comes warmth. That base layer should transport the moisture out to maybe a mid-layer, and the mid-layer is your insulating layer, but it shouldn't trap the moisture. It should allow moisture to, to uh, pass through and get to the outer layer. And the outer layer hopefully is wind and water proof, but also breathable so that uh, higher temperature uh, moisture droplets on the inside of that outer layer can be passed to the outside of that outer, outer layer and either be evaporated or, or fall off the, the jacket that we're wearing. So that's, that's the layering system. And by the way, uh, insulation, um, down is considered a very, very good warm insulation, good warmth to weight but it, it doesn't work very well at all when it gets wet. In my local climate, it's very rarely below zero for long periods of time. So I, I like down if I know it's going to be well below zero, never warm up, and it would be really, really cold, sure, then I'll carry down. But some of the man-made insulations like Primalock and that are a bit better uh, when, they, when they get wet. They're almost as light and insulate almost as well as down, but they're much better when they get wet. Of course, there are other uh, insulating layers like wool, uh, like old fashioned fleece that uh, also work quite, quite well. Um, but uh, and even when they're damp, they work better than, than down. They're just a bit heavier and more bulky. Uh, you'll see accessories there. Accessories are really important. Things like hat, gloves, gaiters, sunglasses and that. Uh, they're not only making you more comfortable, sometimes it's a safety thing. So you should consider that. that. 
Um, we, I mentioned bright colors. Uh, having a jacket that's orange or red, uh, uh, besides being a jacket, you can wave it at, at people uh, uh, wearing it. You're going to be more visible, and that, that helps a lot as well. Uh, you'll see in the bottom right there, footwear. I'm really partial to boots. If you're going to be going he you know, hard and heavy and high in the backcountry, boots are just so much better, I, in my opinion, than shoes because you can really kick into things. You can kick steps, you can edge better, and they support your ankle better, less chance of turning an ankle. Um, if you if you do wear boots or or shoes anything like that just make sure they have a good sole on them too that they're not slip, slippery the slips and twisted ankles are very common causes of injuries that we see and proper footwear i think again can mitigate that and finally not just for clothing but for everything i have a motto and my motto is buy the best get it on sale never pay full price for something it, it, it's almost always on sale and buy your winter gear in the summer when it's on sale. And buy your summer gear in the winter when it's on sale. Uh, you'll be better off buying good quality stuff that don't pay full price. And you can find good quality stuff sometimes not at the fancy stores, uh, not just for clothing, but for some of this gear equipment, uh, Canadian Tire, uh, uh, Marks, uh, the work warehouse, places like that. As long as you know what you're looking for, you can find some, some decent quality stuff for cheaper. A knife, really important to carry. Uh, I would suggest not carrying just a basic knife, but a multi-tool. Most of us do that. We get a lot of tools there, uh, um, you know, uh, scissors, a little pruning saw, that sort of thing. Uh, it, it's more than just a, a, a fancy thing to wear on your belt. It, uh, it can be very, very helpful in a pinch. So consider the weight, consider the cost, but uh, having a multi-tool with you can uh, really be helpful at times. A shelter is also very, very important, uh, the ability to build one. And it's, it seems simple, but it's, again, something you should practice. You'll see at the bottom left there, lots of different ways to build a shelter. You should practice those in your backyard before you actually have to build one for real. Um, one of my favorite things is the orange garbage bag, but uh, I've been told they're controversial because, you know, you put them over your head and you can suffocate yourself. So you have to be careful with it, obviously. But an orange garbage bag can do a lot of things. You can use it as a little bivy sack, keeping your head out where you can breathe, of course. Um, you can cut it into a tarp. You can cut it into strips and use it for flagging tied to trees, that sort of thing. There's a lot of things you can do it. And I, I like things that have multiple uses and that aren't expensive and easy to find. So that's why I like the orange garbage bag. The little silver mylar uh, emergency blanket that you get that, you know, at the end of your 10K run or your marathon, those are handy to have. Um, anything like this, but again, know how to use them, practice uh, a shelter and a bit of cord or a, a something, you know, a tarp and a bit of cord to build a shelter. It seems simple, but it really does require practice. Water and food, everybody seems to know about that, but I know how are you going to carry, what are you going to carry? Um, first of all, water is more important than food. Uh, I always remember the old adage, you can, re you can, live for three minutes without oxygen, three days without water, and three weeks without food. So water is more important than food. Um, you want to carry enough. There are all sorts of different ways to carry water. Uh, you do you with the sort of camelback platypus thing so they can drink as they go. I'm not all that keen on that. Uh, I really like Nalgene, so I've never had a Nalgene break on me. I've never had a Nalgene spill in my pack. And uh, spilling water inside your pack is considered a very, very bad thing. It can wreck a lot of stuff. So I'm, I'm very careful with my water. But carry enough and carry it in, in, in something that will hold it uh, properly. And as for food, I'm not a backcountry gourmet. I'm into caloric density. And by caloric density, I mean I like to carry the most calories I can with the, the, the least amount of weight. And uh, so things that are, that are fatty can help with that, you know, peanut butter, uh, candy bars, and a lot of the high calorie uh, uh, sports sort of bars or, 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 or uh, blocks, candies, those sorts of things. Um, I've got some water purifiers there, but really you only need that if, if you're on a multi-day trip, it seems to me. And uh, a stove, again, multi-day trip. Uh, uh, even if it's a, an overnight, uh, unless it's very, very cold, I often don't bring a stove. I just go with cold food. 
A first aid kit, very, very important, uh, but also important is knowing how to use it and when to use it. Um, yeah, Sandra mentioned uh, person specific. If you have specific needs, if you're diabetic, have, have asthma, have allergies, that sort of thing, you should be carrying the stuff you need. And if someone in your group has those issues, it'd be a good thing to know. Uh, it's also season specific, you know, some hand warmers for winter season and some sunscreen for, for summer. It can be a small uh, um, uh, first aid kit if you're on a day trip or a very large one if uh, you're going on an expedition. Again, having it with you and also having the knowledge are important. Getting close to the end here, gang. Uh, a navigation device is important and nothing beats an old fashioned map and compass, but also knowing the basics on how to use it. Know your north, south, east, east, west. Uh, if it's a topographic map, know how to read uh, what's uphill and what's downhill and how steep those hills are. Not just for maybe having to hike them, but also standing on a precipice and knowing what a cliff looks like. Uh, there's lots of mapping software now on your phone, but we'll talk about having a phone and how that can be both a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, GPSs are helpful, but again, knowing how to use it, having battery, enough battery power for these things for your GPS and your phone are important. Final thing is a communication device. And everybody says, well, I have my phone and that's all I need. But if you're using your phone for your light, for your navigation device, for your communication device, and also for your camera and uh, uploading your photos to post online, because we all know if you don't post it, it didn't happen, you're going to burn through your battery pretty quick. And so that's why having a separate device for each of these is a really good idea. And also always leaving one phone in a pack turned off or turned at least onto airplane mode is a really good idea to save its battery function to use in case of emergency. Uh, there are other communication devices. We won't go into great detail here, but satellite mess messaging devices now are really, really great. Basically, things like inReach now, which is a satellite text messaging device, so you can both send and receive text messages by a, sat by a satellite, is really a good way to do it. Remember, though, maybe an extra battery uh, uh, for whatever device you're using in your phone. This is going to be necessary. So, those were the first three T's. And the fourth T I've added is hug a tree, which is actually another adventure smart, uh, uh, a great uh, saying. And it's a course they teach to kids in, in uh, primary school. So the, the idea being that if you're, if you're lost or in distress, stay put, hug a tree. It makes search and rescue uh, efforts way easier if we're going for a stationary subject than one that keeps moving, okay? That's it. To review, I told you a bit about my philosophy about North Shore Rescue and some statistics on NSR. We looked at a real rescue and we dissected it to, down to what went wrong. We looked at what I call four T's and I reviewed 10 essentials that are at least part of that take the essentials. I wanna end with some words from a rescued subject and I can't say it any better. This subject emailed back our team after they were rescued and they said, they learned they should never assume anything. They went on a hike, but their friend planned a trip and we all assumed she had the trails all prepared. However, it turns out she only had the map online and when we couldn't reach cell service, we were left without map or directions. It also taught me that even if only one friend is planning a trip, it means that everyone in the group should still know where we're going as well and never assume it's just a walk in the park. When my friends told me we were going hiking, I assumed we were going for a light walk and didn't pack any emergency equipment like my first aid kit, orange garbage bag, pocket knife matches, compass map, battery gloves, mittens, and tinfoil. I was once part of the scout movement for many years, and this experience taught me even bigger lessons why our motto is be prepared. I'm going to do this once more because it's just so helpful. I promise this is the final, final words from another subject that emailed North Shore Rescue, who said, thank you so much for rescuing me and my dog from Cypress Mountain last night in your Eagle Bluffs trail. I'm still traumatized from my ordeal last night, and I'm so grateful. Yesterday was supposed to be an adventurous hike, but it turned out to, a, it to be a rescue mission. I set off from Cypress Bowl Car Park at 1 p.m. with no basic emergency equipment, such as thermal blanket, no cell phone, battery charger, no headlamp. 
I thought I had plenty of daylight for my return journey. As a result of my lack of preparation, it got dark quickly on my return from the summit. I scrambled in pitch darkness. I was scared and confused. I fell in ditches several times, hit my head on rocks, my cell phone battery almost out. I was damp and cold and suffering from hypothermia. It was snowing heavily. I'm writing to the teammates this morning with no injuries and in one piece because you found and rescued us. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for your volunteer services. I have learned my lesson and spread, spreading the word. It doesn't matter whether you're hiking alone or in groups, please prepare. That's it. That's all I have to say. Thanks for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions if you like. Oh, thank you, sir. It's uh, absolutely marvelous. And look at all the people clapping in the uh, reactions there. That's perfect. Uh, we do actually have tons of questions. Uh, so we'll just jump right in. Uh, one question was, I believe it was from Oren, uh, what's good to wear that's also good when there's a potential risk for fire? So uh, people, uh, we normally say avoid cotton. Uh, but this person says that, of course, cotton's a little bit better if there's a chance that you're actually going to be exposed to fire. Uh, I don't know whether or not we actually encourage people to be recreating where they're so close to fire that uh, an ash is going to get on their skin. So what's your take on that, Dr. Ack? I, I agree totally. Um, I realize that a lot of the more man-made things uh, uh, may not be better around fire. But I always say cotton kills. Cotton gets wet. It's heavier when it's wet, sucks heat out of your body when it's wet, as opposed to insulating. So I'm not a fan of cotton. If you're going to be around fire, then you're going to want to use the materials that the forest firefighters use. However, they're not very user friendly. They're heavy, they're thick, and they're uncomfortable to wear. And the poor firefighters get a lot of heat stress from wearing them. Um, that's, I agree with your first statement though. If you're going to be close to fire, maybe you got to think of what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, this factory answer, but that's what I got. No, it's, no, it's, it's fair. I don't know whether or not from a sound judgment perspective, it, uh, uh, it probably might be a little bit off to the side. Now, obviously you might find yourself in, uh, unusual circumstances. Uh, but if you know, if you're going out and you know that there's going to be a fire, maybe you should be avoiding it. I take on that one. Um, Todd asks, uh, he heard that NSR uses the Gaia app. And if that's true, do you think it's better than other phone-based navigation apps and why? I, I have a take on that myself. Like, it really depends on what you are most comfortable with. I don't use Gaia. Uh, I, uh, I have another application that uses the same base map as Gaia because almost all of them use something called open street maps, right? Uh, and uh, OpenStreetMaps is sort of the base, and then you ha they la load on other uh, uh, maps on top of them. And it really depends to me on what, what you prefer. What's your preference? You're right. There are many out there, and I use different ones, but most of the time now we use one, uh, SARTOPO, made by a company, I think it's CalTOPO, um, that works very well for our purposes. I think more important that which one you choose is which one you're comfortable and facile with and adept at using and, and stick to one and, and know how to use it and practice with it. Yeah, and and also the other thing is, uh, depending on your device, there may be some that use more battery or less battery and stuff like that. And it might be worthwhile just looking around. Uh, I had a question for, I'm gonna ask Sandra maybe this one. Uh, information shared with the media as far as uh, newcomers. So if newcomers are coming in, people come into the airport and the first thing that they do, they go on, they find some listicle and it said, grouse grind is the perfect place to go, right? Uh, how do we get that information out to them that says, you know what, uh, as I said, it's winter in the mountains, but it's summer uh, at the base. How do we work that kind of information uh, so that visitors can know? We do our best through the BC Search and Rescue Association. Uh, our team here is able to take media requests. Uh, we encourage media groups to reach out to us to learn more and that will allow us to work together. Uh, we just got through the long weekend and, and we released a little bit of information uh, and we're able to have some interviews and build that trust and confidence with media, but also increase awareness for the listeners. 
for international visitors or those from outside British Columbia, we know a number of you join us on these webinars, which we're grateful for and, and knowing that we exist and you sharing it with family and friends that we have these resources for you. Uh, they're reliable, you can count on them and we're here to help you. The whole idea when Adventure Smart was created, as I mentioned earlier, almost two decades ago, those that, that built it in the beginning and that, that came up with this wonderful concept and it's grown in so many ways. The idea was to increase awareness for all levels of enthusiasts, no matter what your background is, where you're coming from, where you live, but you've come here or you're living here and you love to play outdoors. The idea is that we increase awareness as much as we can with different partners to really come up with targeted initiatives so that we can reach everyone um, effectively. It's, it's a unique conundrum, to be honest. Uh, we, we try our best to work with the data that we have. Uh, all of those 1500 search and rescue incidents are entered into the data management system in the province of British Columbia. We're able to craft and build messaging and outdoor education for events like this and many others, work with partners like ALEC, uh, the 78 SAR groups, tourism groups, Avalanche Canada, BC Parks, Parks Canada, regional municipal parks, uh, scouts, guides, the list goes on. And then we can also come up with targeted projects and our trail specific safety videos, which if Scott has a chance to toss those in at any point before we close tonight, is a really good outcome of that strategy. So data, partners, and then projects. To conclude, and then I'll pass it back to you, Scott, we work closely with and have with over the years with uh, newcomer societies, multicultural societies, Fairchild TV, which, which is a unique uh, radio, pardon me, television station that reaches a different demographic than maybe our social media does and our programs do. I only speak English, so I do my best to work with others who speak other languages. And we've trained other volunteer outdoor educators who do speak other languages. They get trained in this messaging. It's very consistent and the curriculum is there for them to use. And then they can adapt it to their audience and the language that's required where they where they know that they can help in their community. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, there are only time for two more questions. We'll try and do a little bit of a, a, a speed round here. Uh, Stephanie was fortunate enough to have Dr. Ritchie on a call out when she had a bad head, head injury and a, from a fall near uh, the Lions. She asks, what would you, your recommendation, Dr. Ritchie, be on the amount of weight a backpack should be? That's a very difficult question. The, the heavier the backpack, the harder it's going to be to hike. Uh, you're going to be able to, uh, sometimes speed is helpful to get out of trouble or to get in before nightfall. It's also a heavier pack, uh, especially if it's packed top heavy, can cause you to fall and hit your head. But you have to carry enough stuff in it too. Um, I'm not going to be able to give an exact answer, but you're going to have to carry what you need. And if it's quite heavy for you, you should train with a heavy pack ahead of time, both for the physical fitness aspect and for the balance aspect and learn how to maneuver with a heavy pack and learn how to pack it with the heavier things in the bottom and the lighter things at top. Um, I can't give you a specific weight. Yeah, it really depends on the person, right? Like uh, uh, there's there's people who could take 120 pounds. I'm perfectly happy with a 40 pound day pack. Uh, there are people who want to have a 10 pound day pack. It really depends, right? Uh, and for the final question, and this one's a bit of a challenging one, I think we all have the answer to this one uh, in our own ways, but Greg wants to know, do you find that experienced hikers make mistakes? Absolutely. Bad things can happen to good people. Um, I would say that with North Shore Rescue, most of, our, most of our rescues happen with inexperienced people and or people doing things they ought not to have. They ought to have known better, but the most experienced, the best qualified people, uh, um, sometimes bad stuff just happens and that's the nature of the beast. Adventure has risk. You can do everything you can to mitigate that risk and something bad can still happen but we rescue them all and we don't charge any of them money. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Sandra. 
Thank you, Alec. That was wonderful. I sat glued to the screen. I hope hope everybody else did as well. You know, some great reminders, some consistencies, as you mentioned, that that we shared the other day in person at an event in North Vancouver, and then again today. So it's really good to repeat. I think these messages, which our audiences see as well in the theme throughout our summer and winter series. You know, I kick it off with that throughout each one. I think they're friendly reminders, and, and thank you for going into the detail of all the research and the effort and time and energy that North Shores built over the years uh, and that and your time dedicated to that SAR group. We were so grateful that you took the time to spend with us tonight, more hours that you volunteered outside of responding to a call. Uh, we appreciate your helping us educate the public as well. My pleasure. We have, thank you. We have a couple of things to give away. Like Scott mentioned, one of them is everyone who joined us tonight will receive a one month free trial with FATMAP. So that will be shared with you in the follow-up email. Recording of this will be available as well, plus we post it on YouTube if you feel like watching again or sharing with others. I'll also put it in the event on our Facebook page. But I do have a skill testing question. This is where you get uh, quick with your fingers and get ready to answer and type quickly. It's something that one of us said this evening. It's a simple question, but it's your chance to win a wonderful, flexible gooseneck light source from Bright Source. There are partners this evening that are providing a wonderful giveaway. The question is, can you type out, and Scott will pick the first one that comes through, what the stop analogy stands for? It's an important one, and that's why I went there tonight. And um, we have to explain. Okay, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, a couple of people just put the word stop. Stop. <laughs> stop means stop. Well, there you go. <laughs> I didn't make it that easy. I didn't make it that easy. No. <laughs> that was quite funny. Thank you for being so quick, though. Well, let's give 10 out of 10 for the speedy uh, fingers there and the answers. So Kathy is um, our winner love... tonight. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks for playing, everybody. That's awesome. And I know you are from all over the place. Thank you for taking time away from your family and friends. And as we conclude tonight, I hope you can join us for the next one. It's June 15th. It's all about canine safety. So if you like furry friends and you have any in your home, their family, I know, the next session is with an expert all about canines and safety in the outdoors for work or play it'll be it'll be a great session because i know a lot of us go hiking with our dogs or friends bring them along on behalf of the 3400 search and rescue volunteers in british columbia from the 78 search and rescue groups and the whole team of us here at the bc search and rescue association and bc adventure smart thank you for your time have a great summer and hopefully you can join us back again take care good night